Welcome, everybody. That was absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning. I've seen it before, but it gets better every time. There's more and more detail each time you see it. Um, I just want to introduce Tristan um, as uh, a recent uh, member of the BSC. Uh, um, Tristan's uh, career thus far involves some of the best stop motion work I think I've ever seen, um, including work with Ardman, uh, doing, is it the wrong trousers, chicken run? Kiss the um, wear it. And also Paranorman, worked on. And then working with Wes Anderson, doing Fantastic Mr. Fox. Um, and there was some work on Grand Budapest Hotel, is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay. And this. And also, but also some live action stuff. And yes. you worked with um, uh, Loving Vincent, you worked on recently, and then Isle of Dogs uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, exactly. Um, how did you first get to work with Wes um, from, you know, from that background? Um, I, heard, I had heard that Fantastic Mr. Fox was, sh was shooting in London, and I, I just tracked down the producer and banged on the door because I'd, I'd sort of fallen... Maybe this is wrong to say, but I kind of fallen out of love with Ardman a bit, and I think they've fallen out of love with me. And I, I just felt like snipping the umbilical cord and getting out. And so, you know, they were the only show in town really at that point. And then this other movie was coming into London. So I, I found the producer and I went to her and I beat on the door and I, I gave her my reel. And that went to Wes and, and I got the job. Um, what I didn't know at the time, um, and which I still feel a level of shame about, is that they had actually already appointed a DP, which I had no idea about, and I only found they out had appointed they had already okay. appointed someone, so who, who they then unappointed. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then I, we went into this process that was fantastic, Mr. Fox, which was uh, staggeringly frustrating, but also very exciting, because Wes had never worked in this medium before, and we had certainly never worked with Wes, and so... We were, we were open-jawed every minute of every day at, at how he worked and what he wanted, and, and he was finding his feet with the medium as well. Um, that said, I'm very happy with that movie. And then when Isle of Dogs came along, uh, we kind of knew what, what we were getting, and so that, the, the process of making Isle of Dogs was, was much, much better from that point of view because the creative language was already there. And I think what Wes likes to do is to build a crew and a team around him that he trusts. He, he doesn't like the process of getting to know new people again because that means them learning his language and that like any language takes time to learn. And he's got a specific language, hasn't he, from his live action work. We all know it from you know, wide angle lenses, great depth of field, highly composed cinematography. Yeah. Um, what of that does he, did he bring to you at the beginning? Did he say, you know, I've got a storyboard, I've got an animatic, and it has to be this way. The frames are very composed. You can't stray from this. What, what, what was his dialogue with you about that element? Well, I, the first thing I had on Isle of Dogs was, was the script and 12, the first 12 minutes of the animatic. And the animatic, in case you, you don't know, is basically the, the film was fully storyboarded and they, they shot out the storyboard frames timed to a kind of rough cut of what they wanted. The, the script was very good and the animatic was one of the best I'd ever seen and I was immediately you know, taken by that. And I, I, had, I was actually talking to another company about doing another movie and so I had this kind of joyous situation that you very rarely get where you have to decide between two movies. But the, the Wes movie won out and then you go into, you go into his process. I mean, it, you, you don't sign up for a Wes Anderson film thinking you're going to make anything other than a Wes Anderson film. So you have to be on board with being the instrument of his creation but not necessarily having the artistic input of your own that you would have on another movie. You know, he, he will very rarely say, what do you think? <laughs> uh, he's... He likes, he likes to be offered something. He, like, he loves a serving suggestion, does Wes, but you know that having given him the serving suggestion, he will say, yeah, not that. <laughs> um, not that, but this, you know. So, you know, get rid of the peas and the mash and we'll lay the spam out in a beautiful fan shape. Um, so it's, you know, it's very much that, that thing. But again, this, this trust thing comes in. You know, he trusts me to do that and I... I often find the process frustrating. I, I admit to that, you know, because I, 
I often think that left to my own devices or maybe working with another director, I would do it very differently. I would do it very, very differently. But at the end of the day, he is making that thing cohesive to his vision. It's an extraordinary achievement, whichever way you look at it. But I mean, that frustration, that sort of control that he has on it and you're kind of having to step back, do you find that uh, impinges on your creativity or do you get to be creative in a different way? Can you express yourself in other ways as a cinematographer? Yeah, I mean, there's two answers. I mean, what, one is, um, one is it, is it is frustrating, you know, and sometimes, uh, you know, I'll get onto a set and I just, I'll just think, wow, this is a beautiful, this, what a beautiful set this is. I mean, the opening shot in the movie is the Shinto temple and the priest comes in and rings the bell and opens the screen. And that set was, as you could see, ab absolutely astonishing. I mean, it was beautiful. It's all handmade. What size would that be? Uh, it was about, about 14 feet wide, I think, and about five, six feet high. So it was quite a chunk. Okay, they're it? not small models. No, so. they're, not, they're not tiny. I mean, this is, our, this is a real dog from the movie. So we work, we're working to this scale. So a dog's that big and a human's about that big. Atari's obviously a child, so he's smaller. So we work, we work within that scale. Um, and that set came onto the floor and I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to enjoy myself with this set. Um, and I lit it and I thought, yeah, that looks, that looks great, actually. Um, so I saved a still of it off and put it on my, my own computer. And then I, I, you know, I sent it to Wes and Wes went, no, it's not what I want. No, I, it wasn't what, it, I knew it wasn't what he wanted, but, it, you know, he loves flat light and he wanted that. You know, he used to use this expression, I want it to look like a very socked out day, which was basically as cloudy as you can get, almost no shadows, and, you know, very, very little contrast, you know. So anyway, I, I did that, and he loved it, and I took another, another frame, put that on my computer, and I went home, and my girlfriend came in from work, and I opened my laptop, and I showed her the still of what I'd done, and she went, wow, that looks beautiful. Um, and then I showed her the next still, and she said, what the fuck's that? And, and I went, that is, I said, that's what I did, and that's what he wanted. And she said, that looks like he took a piece of your soul out. And I felt, <laughs> at that moment, that's exactly what it felt like. And he still got it. Uh, I have still got it. I've got it in my bag. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's like that, and sometimes, you know, he'll, he'll just send you a cryptic note, like, um, I think this needs some of your magic, which is, which is a very difficult note to get. Yeah, you then of, think, yeah, not that precise, is it? No. But is I it true that he's not often on set? Is he usually in the States and you have to se send stuff he's, back all the time? He could be anywhere. I mean, he, yeah. the thing is, he's, he's eternally present, but not physically there. I mean, he's like... The Wizard of Oz, he's the guy behind the curtain, but because of you know modern Wi Fi speeds, mm -hmm. I whatever I send him, I will get a reaction within 30 seconds. You know, and this is in the loo. Um, he's on his computer as we hit the floor in the morning, and he's there until they shut the cutting room at nine, ten o'clock at night. So he's absolutely there, and although that seems ridiculous uh, as a process. He is, he is ever present and the whole process is conducted by email and very, very occasionally phone. Uh, he'll often refuse to take a phone call and we'll, and we'll, we'll go off in this great sort of email conversation. But um, my personal feeling about it is that what, what he gains from working in animation and what he gains from working in that way is that he can compose the whole thing in 2D. Uh, because, as you were saying about this fantastic composition and detail, I think what we're making is essentially a picture book. So you, you turn a page and you look at a beautiful illustration and you look all around it. You know, it's, he's not a filmmaker who throws the eye to a particular point in the frame so as to carry the action. It's more of a tableau. It's a tableau, yeah. exactly. And when you turn the page, even though you, it might just be a cut to a different angle within the scene, it doesn't necessarily have to have that level of continuity. It can just be another beautifully composed image. It's not dissimilar to his live action. No, in it's, a way. It's, it, it isn't. And this, this is, um, you know, this is where it gets hard because 
I know you want to come on to working with wide angle lenses and very deep focus. Um, when you're working with guys this big, if you take a focus on that head, you know, obviously if I, if I took a close up on your head, I could happily do it from here. Uh, and I could, I could get the back, I could get the far horizon in focus if I needed to. But if you take a, a close up on this guy, and we're shooting full frame, so we're shooting eight, eight perf um, digitally, but those of you who are of that age. Um, so he'll want a close up, the tightest lens would be a 28. He may want a close-up on a 20. Let's just uh, add to that, that you, what, what camera are you shooting on? Uh, we're, we're shooting on digital stills cameras. Um, it's a Canon... Canon 1DX. Right, so it's a very good full-frame sensor. It's full-frame sensor, it's a big old sensor. So you put a 28mm lens on that and it, it's super wide. Uh, so to get a close-up on this guy, we are at minimum focus. And minimum focus on the lenses we use is about 20 centimetres. Uh, so you're banged onto minimum and you're focused on his eye. Now at a conventional live action stop, you know, if you're shooting at 2.8, pushing it to 4, you would not have his ears in focus. So because he loves a, because he loves a, a very deep focus, he wants the end of his nose in, he wants the back of his head in, and he... He wants the background in as well. So, so where do you go? Well, you go, you know, you go to 16 and you can hear the lens starting to squeal a little. And, and you'll send him it and he'll go, is, is that all you can give me? And you'll go, well, I don't really want to go to 22 because these lenses really don't work very well at that level. And if you, if you look at the film, you will have been very aware of the amount of chromatic... Uh, aberration there is in the fur because what the fur yeah. does is it 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 splits the light you know you're getting diffraction in the fur and on on the lenses we use which because we hold an inventory of uh, 140 150 lenses um, which we have to buy because we shoot for two years um, I can't buy lenses that cost 25,000 pounds each uh, so I'm, f I'm fighting my glass, I'm, fi I'm fighting the quality of the lens, I'm fighting focus, I'm fighting depth of field. So you have to find a way to do that. And added to that is the fact that compared with this guy, that camera is the size of a small car. So you're getting in the way of everything that's hitting this guy lighting-wise if it's coming from the front, because the camera's here, and the camera, it's a stills camera, it's but it is still sizable. Yeah. You know, it's here, so it's blocking. So, you know, we have to find ways of working around that and, and making, making it look like we haven't taken that trouble. So you're pouring a lot of light onto the set? I mean, is it a Not a very, huge amount, because no. what I've got is, uh, I've got complete control over my shutter speed. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can expose for two seconds if I need to, in order to find my 16 or even my 22. Um, so that's not the problem. It's it's every it's everything else. Being, it's the physics that that are the problem. And quite often, you know, if 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 he's very insistent, we'll drop a green a green card behind the foreground characters, shoot them, take them out, and shoot the background as a plate. But for the most part, he likes to do things in camera. He does right? like yeah. to do them in camera. But I yeah. often think of I often think of that that claim uh, as being a little bit like insisting you will not have. Pain relief for childbirth, which is it's a very it's a very good plan, but at the end of the day, uh, you might just need Give me the epidural. Drugs. Yeah. So, um, I'm full of analogies tonight, aren't I? Well, um, so uh, there there is more VFX addressing of issues than mm -hmm. he would like us to it's believe. It's not as romantic, is it? It's not as romantic, and, and but you know some things are beyond Newton. You know, you just you just can't get them. But let's describe the kind of the scene then. You, you shot at three mils. Yeah. How many sets did you have built at any one time and how many did you have to light at any one time? When we were at full chat, uh, I think we had 43, 44 shooting units and then we had four or five test units uh, where animators would sort of 
go through the motions of particularly tricky stuff in terms of what the puppets could do. But actual proper shooting units, um, between 40 and 45, I guess. So you have 40 and 45 sets that you've lit, and you're going from one to the yes. other to the other. Exactly. To the other. So the, the, the thing is, obviously, no, no, no two sets are ever ready at the same time. So it's, we, have, we have sort of... Uh, I like to think of the camera crew as a sort of herd of wildebeest, really. So every morning, you might be having to turn around between 15 and 20 units. Uh, and that might be as simple as a reframe on, on an existing set, or it might be the whole set comes out, the unit is broomed out, a new set comes in, set dresses go in, art department, we go in, motion control, and that set is brought to a point of readiness. It's, when it's at full chat, it is an intensely busy environment. This idea that it's two guys in a shed is highly misleading. We had half of all the real estate at Three Mills to shoot this on. We had three, four pretty big stages and a couple of the rehearsal rooms. And the model makers are all there as well? Model making's there, construction's there, uh, VFX are there, editing. We've got pretty much everything on site, um, which is, from my point of view, is fantastic because I can walk straight into the art department and say, I've got an issue with the texture on this wall. I can go up to VFX and say, can you slap this together for me so I can have a quick look? You know, you've got that immediacy of having them there rather than having to wait. Which is, which is great. But they're talking about the, the duration that a scene takes to shoot. Trying to get feedback from the director, presumably, it can be quite frustrating because he's obviously got to wait for that scene to play out. Mm. You'll see, will he go back and say, reshoot the whole thing, make this mm. adjustment or that adjustment? Well, I mean, there's a yes and no answer to that because, uh, again, because we've got, you know, from the entire stage is networked. So every camera is effectively pinging every frame live up to edit. So at any one time, he can jump in and view work in progress. Uh, it's slightly more complicated than that, but essentially, we can, we can render out a quick time and get it to him very, very quickly. Um, he, his process for reshooting. I mean, reshooting in animation is, is anathema because um, some poor guys put, you know, hours, days, maybe weeks of work into that piece of animation. You know, I mean, the animation process takes a long time. And if you say to them, can you have another go? You're like, you know, that, that's a lot of time wasted. So we, we tend to keep an eye on it along the way. And we also don't tend to start shooting until everything is ready. And that's not just from a camera, lighting, set, motion control point of view. It's also if the animator has tested sufficiently to know that they can go into that performance, which is essentially what it is. It's a protracted performance. And do they have voice recording to work yeah. to as well? Yeah, the entire film exists essentially as a radio play before we start, and then that is broken down phonetically. And they have a piece of software fantastic piece of software actually, which has transformed what we do called Dragon Frame, which has a number of pages. It has a camera page, so I've got full control over camera. It has a DMX page, so I can run lighting chases through that. It has an animation page, and in the animation page, down the right-hand side, is a phonetic breakdown of the verbal track, of the audio track. Um, so they can see exactly where, you know, if I say hello, it will have hello written out over the number of frames that takes and every time there's a syllable change within that it will be indicated. So that's where we get this very accurate lip sync from. There's very little ADR. Right. Let's talk a little bit about lighting. Now you've talked about lensing objects of this size. Yeah. What do you bring to the party in terms of uh, tools when it comes to lighting? Because obviously if you've got things like a spotlight, like there are a couple of theatrical set, uh, settings here where you've got a spotlight over somebody yeah. which might in conventional terms, be a source for uh, or follow spot of some sort. How do you scale everything down to work on that level? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, think, I think the preconception is that everything we work with is very tiny. And in actual fact, we've got everything from very big to very tiny. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we use a lot of big lights. Um, and we, we use a lot of microscopic grain of sand sized LEDs, you know, things like that. Um, for those spotlights, um, that is either a dado with an iris and a lens in it, um, or it's a thing called a Source 4, which is a glorious little light that started out life um, 
just lighting window displays in shops, but has now become made by Altman in the States, and it's basically a miniature Source 4. It's about that long. Four shutters, two lenses, gobo holder, iris, everything you need, but only that big. 12 volts. Um, they're super handy. But if I'm lighting a big exterior, you know, if I've got a park or a street or something like that, what I actually need is a light with a very, very big lens. So then we're talking 10, 12K. Um, when I was in the States, I had these beautiful Mole Richardson bug-eye 10s, which have got a lens about this big. They're very hard to get hold of here. So we tend to use an Arri T12, which is, has a lens about that big, because uh, what you want is coherent shadows to make it look like proper sunlight and the smaller the source the more splayed out your shadows are so the bigger the source the more like natural sunlight it, it so works. a small source close to this would reveal itself because of the size of the shadow exactly um, in an in an exterior environment I mean once we once you're into sets you know once you're into buildings uh, you can do what you like. You can fiddle about with super tiny stuff and, you know, put in practicals. And we use a mixture of LEDs and small tungsten fixtures because sometimes nothing looks like a dimmed tungsten fixture. It just has a warmth and a, a look to it with the filament that is very hard to get with an LED. Uh, was that used for flames and fire? What did you use for that? Because there's some lovely effects there. Things burning or candles or what, what did they yeah, use? Yeah, well, that? again, we have, as I said, we have full DMX control over every source on set. I think we can go up to about 170 channels on the, on the DMX. So we, we can set a proper chase running. And of course, that's just broken down into frame size chunks. So the, an the animator, I must stress, works entirely alone on the set. We're not hanging around going, come on. Uh, once, <laughs> once the set is ready for animation, the crew pull out and they're left on their own and on we go. Um, so when they press a button, everything is automated for them. So the camera turns over, any lighting change is affected, any motion control is affected, um, and then on they go. And they you leave them to that? And well, you're leave, off to them? Leave them entirely to it. If they get into okay. trouble, they pick up a walkie-talkie and shout for help from okay. whoever they need you know, a puppet maintenance guy or a camera assistant or whatever, will come in and, and sort them out. The other thing we did on this movie, which um, is, is not something I was particularly happy with, but is, is the natural result of having too much tech, um, is because nothing's moving in front of the camera, we can take an exposure and then we can change the lighting and we can take that exposure again and we can lay each of those exposures into a separate file. So the shot might exist in nine or ten different versions, each one with a slightly different look to it. Uh, and this sort of thing was happening uh, for things like explosions and lightning, whereas before we'd have gone, OK, on frame 136, the lightning starts. It's a 15-frame chase, and it goes... You know, and we'd have sat down and gone, how does that look? Yeah, OK, we'll do that. So now what we have the facility to do is to expose every frame at a different lightning look. And then you pick your point in the shot where you want to put that in. So and you're sort you of bracketing can, it. You can, you're, you're kind of auto-bracketing, yeah. um, and you can do what you like with it. You know? And similarly, you, know, you can do, you can do fade-ups and fade-downs wherever you like. Is you're that just, applicable to exposure as well? I mean, you're effectively doing an HDR. You're kind of making an HDR, but we, we didn't use in that for that, I, I think that will come. Um, but certainly, yeah, if you're fading up and fading down, you just do a frame with the lights off and the frame with the lights on, and then you decide somewhere down the line. For me, that parks the creative process way, way down in the post. And you've then got hundreds of more decisions to make, which you could quite easily have made on set, you know, and why wouldn't you? You know, it's just, it's like, oh, can I, can I just have the choice of it later? You know, it's sort of, Another one of those things that digital has deprived us of, I think, you know. It gives and it takes away. Yeah. I've got a question about when you're, you're blocking a scene with real human beings and, you know, you see where they're going to move and you think about where someone t goes to a staircase, they turn back and you think, I'm going to need an eye light. Yeah, there. yeah. How do you predict with these sets and these uh, scenes where you're going to need to find a little slash of light, you know, when the dogs moved over there and you, yeah. obviously you, you can't see it in advance, you can, except through an animatic, you're going to have to position a light just for that moment. How do you uh, set that up in advance and walk away from it? 
Um, well, there's a couple of ways. I mean, we, we do do a lot of kind of live rehearsal with humans. Um, you know, we have a thing called the lab, which is the live action video booth, um, where the animators will, will just go and work out the choreography themselves. Also, Wes will send little clips of himself, which are mostly hilarious, um, <laughs> which he's filmed on his computer, and he'll go, I want an expression like this. And then he'll send that as a little, literally that, because there's never, there's only that and that for Wes. There's no in between. Um, and then, then the animator will take the puppet and will place it in key positions on the set. So that's that's how we get around that. And I, you know, I will, I'll keep an eye on that, and I'll say, okay, just show, just show me where he's going to be at this point, and they'll they'll set it up, and then I can put in those extra little bits and pieces that I need to. Okay. One thing I think you know we relish as cinematographers when we're shooting live action is, is that the sense of movement and blur and things falling and wind and yeah. motion, you know, rain and you know, clouds and all of that's in this film. But obviously, you're not filming that in motion. I mean, how do you accommodate that into your lighting style? I mean, are you, do you try and put moving lights into the program, or yeah. do you just are you relying on the animators to move cotton wool or cellophane to, to create that that movement? That yeah, I mean, a, a bit of everything, really. I mean, one one thing that do, that does bug the hell out of me on the, in this movie, actually, which I had a lot of back and forth with Wes about, is the amount of strobing in it because yeah, we it a lot, isn't it? yeah we can shoot. We can, we can go motion with motion control. It's, it's not an issue for us to create a realistic in-frame in frame blur. But he wanted that super choppy look, which um, actually a couple of the most beautiful sets are completely lost. Yeah, towards to this the beginning, kind of yeah. Very frenetic overlay of, of frames. Um, but yeah, or, organics are, are tricky. So, you know, smoke, rain, fire, running water. Um, and maybe with another director on another movie, we would shoot elements, live action elements, and lay them in. Uh, I've done that a lot. I've, I've, I've shot rain, fire, water. Um, when we create a library of live action stuff, which is just then popped in. There's, there's a shot in Curse of the Were Rabbit where Gromit lights the, lights the gas under the kettle, and that's a live action gas hob element just dropped in under an animated kettle. Um, but, but Wes wants it to be handmade, and, and a, that's his thing. And, and so that's what we, that's what we serve him. Uh, it does mean the consumption of, of colossal quantities of cling film, because all the, all the water, all the seas, um, including the waves washing up the shore, that's all animated with cling film. It's a Amazing. labor of love. It's incredible. It's interesting because at the beginning you were talking about how much he likes soft, flat lighting, and, you, yeah. and in some of the other films of his, you, you know, it's very evident. But actually, there's a lot of contrast in here as well. Some beautiful edge lighting on, yeah. on the one of the dogs goes to the edge. And there's a night, there's a low source. The drummers is beautiful. The light bouncing up yeah. from the drum skin felt real, like you know. Yeah. So he does. He's not averse to you. No, he's not averse. To, it's the bit. exteriors that are the, the killer. You know. He, yeah. he, you feel like, I mean, he grew up in Texas, which is kind of weird, you know, you expect that he grew up somewhere very, <laughs> very cloudy. Yeah. Um, he just, I've, uh, yeah, I shouldn't say, but I've, I've, ju I've just been working on his newest movie and uh, some of the plates I'm working with, um, you, you can actually, you, know, you imagine a situation which is so rare on a film set, which is the gaffer holding the glass to his eye, waiting for the cloud. So <laughs> on the sunniest day, he's going, no, 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 is it, and waiting for it to, cover rather than uncover and it's you know it's a complete reverse of how you would normally it'd be work. fine if you were going to go bleach bypass because then the contrast would all come yeah back it'd into be fantastic it. yeah. um but no we, we just find our ways around it and just step back to the time when you were doing this kind of work on film yeah i, I can't for the life of me imagine the sort of the tension and the stress of waiting for all of this stuff to come back from the lab it was it was hard enough with live action stuff what how how much has it changed with digital for you well it's changed a lot i mean i'm sure you agree with me that because we just shot on film what well, that's all we knew so it wasn't as if we were imagining a world where this tension was going to go away um 
We had a very good relationship with tech and they would do our rushes on a nightly basis and they would get 40 cans, some of which contained eight feet of film. Um, and four of those eight feet would be the run on and the run off and uh, one of those feet would be the board. So, you know, we had, we had a lab that worked with us for stapling all those very, very short bits of film together. And, and we would, you know, we would send off at seven, eight o'clock at night and this was in Bristol and they'd go all the way to Heathrow and they'd be back when we came into work the next morning. And, and that was how the day was constructed. You know, the day started with Rush's viewing and then you went into edit and then you went to the studio floor. And now, as soon as the shot is finished, you, that process is broken up multiply. So, you know, you're, you're immediately, you know, your first AD is trying to drive that set forward and going, okay, that's got to come out now. And you say, yeah, but what, what if it's not, what if it's not right? And you say, no, it's got to come out now. So then you send the shot, and Wes looks at it and, and goes, okay, yes, we can move on. So you, you, you get that rushes process broken up into tiny chunks all the way through the day. And I will tell you that we shot Chicken Run in 72 weeks. We shot Curse of the Were Rabbit in 76 weeks, both on 35 mil. And I have never shot a film that quickly since. So it's had the opposite effect. It's, it's, it's not exactly slowed the process <laughs> down, but what it has done is what I was saying earlier, which is it's introduced so much more choice. So that just takes longer in, in, in the shooting of it. You know? And what was the budget for this film? Do you have any idea? It, it was about 44 million US, which is about average for a stop frame movie. Right. Um, and we, we were very fortunate because the pound was so weak, so we got more pounds for our buck. Mm. On, on Fantastic Mr Fox, which had the same budget, the, it was over $2 to the pound. So there was a very lean production, but bizarrely with the same dollar budget. We just, we ended up with more because of the, the exchange rate. Extraordinary. Should we open up the yeah. floor to questions? Do we have some mics? Do we have any microphones or do we just shout? There's a microphone over there, sorry I couldn't see it. Do you want to pass the mic over? Hi. Um, congratulations, loved it. Um, and also for surviving the creative process. Um, one thing that really stood out to me was, and I found very cinematic, was the way the fur moved on the dogs and the way that correlated with the sound of the wind that kind of fuses in the mind yeah. and sets an atmosphere. Just wondered about the animation process there. Is, was there, is there a fur pass? Is there a team that takes care of fur? Or is it an incidental process because the creatures are being uh, handled anyway? Yeah, the latter. Um, it's entirely a process for covering up the fact that it's impossible to touch something furry without moving the fur. So um, something we developed on Fantastic Mr Fox, which is there's always a breeze um, just to justify that ruffle. Um, I'm afraid it's, it's no more clever than that. But it, it does kind of work. You know, if you put wind on the soundtrack, then you, you believe that. And it's completely organic because the animator touches it in a slightly different place every time. So they're not, they don't even really have to think about that fluffing process. Good answer. Thank you. Any other questions? I believe your camera assistant's here. Is, is, uh, Mark Swaffield, my Mark? golden first AC, is here, who... Without whom none, none of this would have been possible. He ran an inventory of 80 cameras and 150 lenses and did all the training for the assistants and everything else. Brilliant. So, thank you, sir. Thank you. Mark, would you care to say anything a little bit about, uh, you know, your perspective on this kind of working process? I mean, presumably you do live action as well. So, yes. how demanding is it on, you know, your side of uh, the, te the, te the technical process? Um. It, it's equally demanding, I mean, in both arenas, I would say. Um, but with, in a stop frame job like this, it's just, uh, I mean, you've, you've heard it all from Tristan, but it's, um, it's in quantity. It's kind of vast. And it's just sort of taking care of, like, so much stuff. Um, it's really, you know, in, in terms of a first AC's job, you know, your kind of tasks are being broken down. 
So a focus ball needs to be programmed. So it's you, know, you, you kind of rehearse that with an animator. So you're you're not winging anything. You know, and there's nothing to chance. So so everything is absolutely kind of organised before it happens. So there's kind of no surprises. That's one of the main difference differences I would say in stop frame compared to live action. And what about the variety of lenses that uh, we're bringing to the table? I mean, there's a huge, a huge array of glass there. I mean, how do you get a consistency in all of that? Um, through weeks of testing. I mean, the, the job started with just Tristan, myself, and the gaffer, Toby, uh, in a shed in winter, pretty much, just in the cold, just with a couple of lights and focus charts. And, and we just tested every camera that was available on the market. We kind of tested every lens, you make a decision, Tristan makes a decision, uh, and then you start the kind of lengthy process of trying to find them. And that's like a nationwide hunt to try and find, you know, the quantity of sort of one, you know, of a 20 mil, you know, which was used a lot. So we, we needed potentially enough to cover all the, all the, all the units. So, so to try and find sort of, I don't know, I guess we had about 25 actually, 20 mils. 25, 20 mils. Yeah, yeah, I guess we did. Mark's, because, because of the minimum focus, Mark actually um, suggested we use uh, sort of Voigtlander lenses, which have a, a, a shorter close focus for the 20, which was a, a, great, a great find, actually. And they've also got very short barrel length on them, so you can, they're not quite so intrusive. And they cover the full frame? Yeah, they cover the full frame, yeah. yeah. They're a stills lens. Yeah, yeah and, we, and we actually shimmed uh, a handful of them as well, just to, just to eke the close focus just you know, half a centimeter more towards the, the camera body, yeah. towards the focal plane, and it, you know, and that wouldn't turn the background into mush. So, so just lots of little doctoring on things as well. Yeah, we had some 16 mil fisheye lenses. Wes fell in love with um, a John Frankenheimer film called Seconds, uh, which James Wong Howe shot, uh, which has a very, very particular look. Um, it, it differs from Isle of Dogs in many ways. Uh, one, it's Academy, whereas the Isle of Dogs is 239. And two, um, Frankenheimer had this very particular way of framing from the sort of bottom lower corner to the back top corner, which enabled him to use these intensely wide fisheye lenses uh, to give this amazing sort of look. And Wes, of course, frames everything centrally. Um, then we got, we got in these fisheye lenses and he he couldn't understand why they weren't giving him the same effect. And I said, what you, what you need to do, Wes, is you need to move what you're looking at to the corner of the frame. And he, he wouldn't. Um, I, said, I, I said, the least distorted part of this lens is right in the middle, and that is exactly where <laughs> we're looking. Um, so we put all kinds of geometry behind what we were looking at. There's a shot where the dog reaches into the cage and all the geometry of the cage is kind of bent out. And that, that was on a 16. Um, and we shimmed those, we double shimmed those, didn't we? Just to get the minimum focus on those and ran them at 22. Just so that you could get the dog's nose right up to camera. I noticed there was when the boy's in the hospital and the, a surgeon or doctor's leaning over him, that was a really distorted... Yeah, I was wondering whether the set had been built like that. It's no. just a kind of as, as a kind of a, a device, but that was a lens. That, that was a sixteen as well. Wow. Yeah, six, six, sixteen fish eye. Okay. We've had some very nice fifteen uh, rectilinear lenses actually, which were which were lovely with great big front end on them. Um, but no, we we kind of had to have everything that he might want, and we bought lenses all the way through the production because he, you know, he'd have another kind of thing he wanted to try and. You know, so you've got you've got just racks of lenses. Well, we sell we sell everything at the end. I mean, it's, oh, you do? Okay. yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> anyone who wants really good quality kit should look out for the end of a stop frame movie because we okay. buy all our lighting and grip new. So we had you know just for an example, we had six hundred C stands on this job. Okay, six hundred C stands, six hundred knuckles, short arms, long arms. That's just C stands. Okay, they'd never been on a truck in their life. So they were absolutely pristine, pristine and you get you probably knocked out for about twenty quid each when they when they were sold off because you, you you suddenly had two weeks to sell everything. So there you go. So a lot of film schools do very well out of us. So. <laughs> the cinematographer and second-hand equipment salesman. Yeah. No, I I wish I wish. <laughs> Any other questions, Gavin?
Sorry, apologies if I missed this answer, but how long roughly do you get to light a set for uh, a major sequence? And have you ever got halfway through f shooting that sequence and realized you found a better way of doing it, but it's too late? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, isn't that just where you just sweat quite a lot and don't tell anyone? Yeah. Um, it's how long is a piece of string, I think. You know, the, the, the sets vary from, you know, a piece of wall with a close-up face in front of it to some enormously elaborate, you know, construction like that Shinto temple. Um, you know, so what we have with 40-odd set shooting is we, we do have a little bit of slip in the system, so, you know, which, which takes care of things that go wrong. So if you have a couple of sets that are sticking a bit, you've still got... 40 odd still shooting. So at full chat, there is, there is that little bit of luxury in there. But I'm, I'm pretty quick, I think, you know, it, it, the, the, the lengthiness comes from when Wes starts to, to tinker with it, you know, because you're showing something and, and it'll be fine. You know, he, he won't give you any notes at all. And then just before you turn over, he'll, he'll have had a thought, you know, can we just, he's very keen on a, a point source in the back of frame. So that's, I always have a few of those standing by now, because I know he's going to say, you know, can you just put a point source on the horizon for me? And you'll put one in, and then they go, can you put three in equally spaced? <laughs> so you put three in, and then they'll, and they'll find out that one's, one's being covered by a character, so then they'll, we have to respace them. And it's just, things like that take time, but the, act, the actual process of light, I mean, I, I, do, I have to be pretty quick. I have, I cannot light 45 units myself, so I have a couple of other guys who light for me to my brief, but it has to be pretty strict because it has to look like one hand lit it, and that being my hand. So I, I sit with them, discuss the sequence with them, uh, I look at everything they're doing during the lighting and testing process so that we get some coherence to, to how it looks. Is there any time when you've got nothing to do because everyone's animating and you've lit all the sets and twiddling your thumbs, something do you go off and come back or are you fully employed? No, it's, it's pretty full on because w if that does happen, be because of the length of production, you know, you're shooting for 70 weeks, um, the, the pre-production process is ongoing. So you're prepping for stuff coming up. Uh, you know, you could be a month out, you could be six weeks out, and that consists of, you know, story breakdown, um, going into the art department, looking at the set construction talking with the set dressers about, you know, texturing, colour, all those things, testing, all those things, fabrics, everything that goes before the camera needs testing. And a, a lot of the reason it needs testing is because of the scale, you know, is, is the weave on this pair of silk pyjamas going to look like real silk pyjamas or is it going to look like hessian? And it's very difficult to tell when you're making it in your hand, you know, something can look absolutely beautiful. I, mean, I, I did a movie a couple of years ago that had a mobile phone in it that was this big. It looked absolutely gorgeous. Put it in front of the camera and project it, and you could see every fingerprint on it that the maker had put on it, and it had to go back and be completely remade in a, in a very different way. So, yeah, it's, it, it rolls on. And uh, did you attend the grade at the end? Well, I would like to say that I entirely attended the grade, um, but that would be a lie. Um, and I don't really want to get into it because it still causes me a degree of pain. Because um, I love, as we all do, I love a grade, and I think I'm quite good at them. And I've, you know, I've achieved some very good things in grades. Um, but if if you're the auteur, it doesn't work. I did I did a complete grade on Fox that I was very happy with, and he thanked me for it. And I went on holiday for two weeks, and when I came back, the grader rang me and said. All of the two weeks you've been on holiday, he's been sat in the suite and he's redone it. <laughs> so, I mean, I look at that and I can see stuff that doesn't match and it makes me squirm. But, you know. Look good to me. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> Another question back there. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, could you talk about some of uh, the references that you and Wes shared? Like, I mean, you just mentioned seconds, and I would have a guess, you know, there was some Citizen Kane in there, but, you know... Uh, Certainly, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, the, the biggest thing was this huge tranche of Japanese movies that Wes sent me. I think over 40 titles, um, all with the links, so I couldn't avoid watching them. Um, and there was a great 
a huge variety from sort of 1950s black and white movies through to contemporary colour movies, man, uh, anime stuff. Um, it's a lot of Kurosawa. A lot of Kurosawa. Yeah. Um, I mean, the interesting thing is that th what that gave us was a sort of distillation of Japanese cinema, but a lot of that Japanese cinema is Japanese cinema trying to emulate Hollywood. So it's a kind of, it's a two remove process before you start. Um, the other big influence in the movie, probably even more than the films, is Japanese graphics and Jap Japanese uh, woodcuts. So the Hokusai um, views of Mount Fuji series, for instance, informed a, l a lot of the look of the movie. Um, it's got big sort of solid patches of colour and obviously the volcano and things like that. Um, and, and with Wes, it's, it's, never, it's never a specific movie. It is just like a sort of boiling down. You know, he wanted me to watch 40 movies so that I, I'd kind of been saturated in, in that thing, you know, in, the, in that Japanese aesthetic. Um, so we, we were speaking the same language when he mentioned something to me, which I think is entirely right, you know. Um, I, did, I, did have, I did have some input actually into some of it. The animal testing plant. Um, I, lo I love uh, old buildings that have been taken over by nature. And I, I sent him some references of a place in Scotland called St Peter's Seminary, which is this amazing neo-brutalist concrete um, Catholic seminary in Scotland that was, had to be left because it... Um, it was so modern, it didn't have any proper drainage, and it got concrete cancer, and is now just crumbling away. Uh, and there's also a, an island off Manhattan called North Brother Island that used to be a tuberculosis hospital, and that is now has trees growing up through it. And uh, I sent him a lot of references of that, and they've actually built some of the architecture into the animal testing facility. Which oh, I was actually shooting at uh, St Peter's, literally. Right. Really? Well, yeah, and, and the place was leaking the whole time. We were yeah, there. yeah. That's, well, that's why they had to leave because. Just... And so, and the uh, and the choice of the um, the stuff on the television, which wasn't stop motion, it was a different kind of animation. Yeah. Was that a conversation, or was that again? This is what we're doing. Um, the, the the absolute truth is, it was it was always intended to have stuff on the telly as t as two D drawn. Um, the amount increased as we realised that a lot of the crowd sequences were going to be very, very difficult to shoot as stop frame. Uh, so some of that was just expedient. Um, although you mentioned Citizen Kane, which is, which is uh, obviously the, the mayor in front of the poster is, is driven by that, but also um, we, took a, we took a lot more from that sequence in Citizen Kane because the way the theatre is constructed uh, it's it's layered in, you know. That audience is is shot, moved, shot, moved, shot, moved. And there's a, there's an awful lot of not particularly good map painting in that sequence in Citizen Kane, and we were trying to emulate that. And with the the interpreter booth on one side and the guy on the stage, there, there's a, a shot where um, I think it's the guy who owns the rival newspaper in Citizen Kane looks over the balcony edge, and Kane is down on the stage, very tiny. And that's an exact steal from, from that. So we played with that. Thank you. Any other questions? How specific was Wes in terms of the colour palette he used, particularly with, you know, with the lighting of the clouds and time of day? Yeah, it very. It sounds like um, he's always going to be very hands-on with whatever you do. Yeah, he is, he is very hands-on. Um, time of day um, sometimes varied after we'd shot it, you know, the stuff in there that he's bent into evening, that, that was shot day. Um, the, the scene on the bridge goes to night very quickly. Very yeah. quickly, yes. Yeah. Uh, there's a security camera shot and then it goes to night. Um, but that's just, that's what he does, you know. It's, there's, a, there's also a shot in a hospital where you look out the window and the sky's, everything out the window is purple for no, no good reason. It's just, it just is. Um, but, yeah, he, he slavishly drives the aesthetic, and I think it's almost like having two Wezzes. You know, there's, there's, there's the Wes who you have the initial conversation with, and then there's the Wes who sits on Wes's shoulder going, are you sure that's Wezzy enough, Wes? You know, <laughs> because you get... You know, his producer was telling me this story on the Grand Budapest Hotel where he was shooting, he was shooting anamorphic and he was shooting everything on a 17mm 
lens and this just became like the default lens and then one day he, he said to Bob Yeoman, he said, Bob, let's see this on the 45 and the whole crew went <laughs> this is it. and he put the 45 on and he went, hmm, it's a little bit too tight, can we, can we see it on the 32? So that's the 32. Still, and he came, came right the way back down the box, on went the 17, <laughs> and off they went on the 17. So, yeah, you, you know, he's, he's, he's a, I wouldn't say he's a prisoner of his own style, because it's a style that is, is developing and he's... You're the prisoner of his style. I'm the prisoner of his style, yeah. <laughs> I, well, I try, you know, I, do, I try and sneak in. But you've worked with him again since? Yeah, I'm so working right. with him now. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, you know, it hasn't put you off. I mean, you, there's still no, a lot you get from no, it as a cinematographer. I, no, because I really like him. You see, he's, yeah. he's the most charming, witty, very clever guy. I mean, you know, you sit down and have dinner with him and it's, it's fantastic. You know, he's he's really, really nice guy. And, and so I like him, you know. I, being frustrated by someone doesn't mean that you don't like them. And I also, I, I do, you know, I often say, after you know weeks of frustration, like you know, you look at something and you go, "He was, yeah, he was right. He was, <laughs> he was right about that." Sometimes you can't see it when you're doing it. You know, you just think, "What are we doing? This is insane!" And then it's right. It's such a specific skill set you've got. There can't be many people around who do what you do, certainly to, on this scale. Do you find that you're you know, you're always being asked to do re repeat business in the same way, rather than, you know, your, your, your own desires as a cinematographer might be more towards some more live action, yeah. some different genre. I mean, well, how do you feel about being locked, being pigeonholed a bit by this? I, do, do you know, I used to hate it, but I think you have to be sensible about these things. It's, like, it's a bit like being an actor who's always cast in the same role, Bloody you know, and yeah. moaning about yeah. it. You know, you are working. Um, and you, you know, you do get to a point where you have garnered a level of recognition and respect which starts to pay back and and you know that can't be sniffed at and I'm I'm good at this stuff um, there are many many cinematographers out there who are very very good at shooting live-action movies and I would be jumping into that pond as, as virtually as an unknown I also come with a big label around my neck that says animation which everyone thinks equates to the word slow um, Actually, I find single camera stuff an absolute relief. You know, it's mm. I just, all I have to think about is one thing, you know, not 45 things. So it's, yeah, it, 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 would, be, it would be silly to be annoyed by it. But I do, yeah, I do like to do the other stuff as well. And what are you currently working on? I have got a peculiar set of features at the moment. I'm... I'm shooting a feature in Amsterdam with the Dutch National Ballet, which is live action. Um, so it's live action dancers uh, in front of blue screen and green screen and yellow screen, uh, which are then going to be dropped into a virtual environment. So it'll be a bit like the original Mary Poppins with you know real dancers dancing and things. So that's, that's the film of Capalia. Uh, I'm working with Wes doing some second unit work, which is um, a lot of model stuff. Um, so he's doing set extensions, not with matte paintings, but with models. So a lot of line-up difficulty there, which Mark's about to start with me on. Um, and I'm also working with Ari Folman, who did Waltz with Bashir, and he is finally getting his film about Anne Frank together. Uh, and we're doing some bits for that, not the whole movie, but just some bits. So you're in demand. Is that it? You're going to be busy for the next... Yeah, Lifetime. quite busy, but it's very, as I was saying to you earlier, it's, 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 the, it's the kind of mire of European co-production with very small budgets and lots and lots and lots of executive producers, you know, Luxembourg, Holland, Belgium, France, Liechtenstein, you know, and they all want a say, so it's, it's fun. But it's, you know, it's good to work, come on, it's fun, isn't it? It's always. always. Isn't it fun? I love it. What did Roger say? <laughs> he said, I love my job when he got that Oscar, and I thought, yeah, I love my job, it's great. It's a good note to end on, I think. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Tristan Oliver. Thank you.